Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing... Carter Wilson. Hi there. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm well. How are you, Molly? I'm doing great. Um, so can you tell me about your writing? Yeah, so I write uh, I write uh, standalone dark uh, psychological thrillers. I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm really a little bit obsessed with just how you can't really escape your own mind. Uh, so a lot of my books have to do with paranoia, what's real, what's not real, um, and just people struggling <laughs> to overcome some pretty great odds. That is so cool. Um, now in this book, it's not in. I mean, it is a it is a standalone, but there. Are it's also tied to one of your previous books. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So my previous book was The Dead Husband. And in that book, I had created this fictional town of Bury, uh, New Hampshire. And um, and in addition, I created this this house in which a lot of the, you know, a lot of the book takes place. And when I finished that book, I decided I was not done writing about that house or about that town. Um, so I really wanted to set my next book not only in that town, but also in that same house. And I had to do it with a whole new cast of characters um, and make sure both books were, you know, standalone novels. But if you read both of them in whatever order, uh, there was more to be gained from it for sure. Um, so, yeah, I just got really intrigued by uh, kind of that whole world building aspect of it. Yeah, it's been really fun as a reader because I, I read the first book as well, um, The Dead Husband Club. And throughout this one going, oh, it has this connection here and like slowly kind of noticing that. Cause I, I read That's great. <laughs> that other book oh, last year when it came out. So I had, I'd forgotten, Oh, it's set in Bury. So like it took, it took a, a, like a chapter or so. And all of a sudden I went, Oh my God, it's the same house. And yeah. Yeah. It was a really it, fun realization. It was, and it was a little bit of a struggle because we wanted to make sure that the readers were happy with both books on a standalone basis, but you also end up having some, some things that aren't explained because they might be explained in the other book. Um, so it was, it was a real balancing act, try to write them both as standalone novels. I can imagine. Um, what interested you about Hurry? Because you mentioned that it kind of just, you needed to keep writing about it once you were done with that first one. Yeah, I mean, I my fifth book was Mr. Tinder's Girl, and that was the first book that I based in New Hampshire, in Manchester, obviously a real place. Um, and I kind of just like New Hampshire. I just there's just a vibe there that kind of um, works well for kind of the the creepy undertones that I'm going for. Uh, and I wanted to, and I wanted to find a, a, a town that exactly matched what I was thinking for the dead husband and I couldn't find it. So I just created it. And then it just became a lot of fun because, you know, it's a very affluent community. Um, it's kind of a suburb of Boston, but pretty far away. Um, but everything, you know, everything looks beautiful, but there's obviously a lot of insidiousness <laughs> behind closed doors. Uh, so it was, it was nice to kind of build a whole town that kind of had that, um, just general kind of energy to it. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to see an outsider's perspective on it, too, because in the Dead Husband Club, you see like from Rose's perspective who grew up there. Um, but in this one, it's someone just moving in. So that was right. interesting to see how someone else would perceive it. Right. Exactly. So were there any other pieces of media that inspired this book, like any books or movies or even songs? Well, there was... There was an article that had an element of inspiration to this book um, because essentially what happens is I have my protagonist loses his wife tragically and he has to move uh, with his seven-year-old twins and they move to this house. And then I decided that soon after he moves in, he's going to start receiving these very weird and, uh, you know, threatening notes saying, we're watching you, like just notes on his driveway. That part was actually inspired from a real life case in New Jersey where that happened. This couple moved into this house and they started receiving these notes saying, we're watching this house. We've always watched this house for the last 70 years. And I'm like, I read that article. I'm like, that is so creepy. Um, and it never quite totally got resolved, that other case. But I just thought that was a great element to, to kind of add to my protagonist's uh, you know, despair and paranoia. Uh, so I, I layered that in throughout. Yeah, it made for a, definitely a really fun mystery element to it. Great. Um, so, I yeah, I, I want to talk about that a little bit, what you just mentioned with the lottery element of it. How did you get the idea and 
how did that come about? I'm always fascinated by kind of just extremes of duality. You know, you know, one book I wrote about the Colorado mountains, because I love the idea that it's mountains can be beautiful and a safe haven, but they can also be horrifying. Uh, so I've always liked that. And so I, and I've always been interested in the concept of lottery winners and how, you know, it's usually a curse when you win the Powerball or often it is. And so I like the idea of an opening scene where, you know, this man's at his wife's funeral. I mean, she was 35, very young. So very, you know, the most tragic day of his life. Uh, and that same day he finds out he won the Powerball. And I just like the idea of like, well, what, how are you going to mentally handle these massive extremes of emotion and circumstance. Uh, so it was just, you know, I love to throw challenges at the protagonist and see what they do with it. And that was about, <laughs> that was about as challenging as it can get. Yeah, it was, it was like, yeah, it was fun to see, like you said, that duality um, come across in it. Like it, it kind of puts this character in a position of feeling everything all at once, um, right. which is not always represented. Um, right. While trying to take care of, you know, two seven-year-olds who are also emotionally distraught from the loss of their mother. So, it, you know, it's almost like this guy's not in the place where he's even capable of doing the thing he has to be most capable of doing. Um, so I just wanted to explore that in his mind. Yeah. What sort of things did you do to get into, into the mind of this character? Oh, I drank. <laughs> It's a very boozy book. Um, you know, it's a good question because it, it, normally, you know, most of, not most of my books, probably half of my books are written from a, a female uh, point of view. And I, I tend to prefer that because it really allows me to be somebody totally different and be in a different mindset. Um, so there, but there were some similarities between myself and the protagonist, Marlo. Um, but he, he went to a very dark place. So, you know, it's just it's empathy when you're writing. You just sit there and think, like, what would I do? Um, and if you're given the circumstance, okay, assume that you are going to start losing your mind. What do I think that would feel like? Um, and you just kind of get into that place in your head for an hour or two whenever you're writing every day. And, um, and, and you know, hopefully it works. So I know there was definitely scenes that I had to cut out because I almost went too deep <laughs> into, his, into his mind and it got, it got a little bit crazy. So um, I definitely, there was some editing involved. Yeah. Um, kind of on that, were there any specific times in the book where you had to like kill your darlings? Um, and if so... <laughs> Oh yeah, constantly. I mean, I, I I truly believe there's a couple of things I believe about writing. One that the hardest thing to do is to write that first draft, and so I just think it's kind of got to be heads down, plow through it. Don't worry about how terrible it probably is, because just getting it done really that's the battle. And then it really comes alive in editing, and and I truly believe that. And you mentioned Kill Your Darlings, um, you know, so. I will cut out a lot. Um, and even there are some precious lines I'm like, that's a really good line. And you're like, but it doesn't really make sense. <laughs> or it doesn't serve the story. You have to get rid of it. Um, and, and I'm glad that I do because it really streamlines the story. And I think makes for more, a more of a propulsive tale. Yeah, for sure. Do you do a lot of your plot work like in the editing process and like fine tuning things then, or do you usually do things before? Yeah, I mean, I don't really do any plot work. <laughs> I don't plot at all. Um, so, you know, when I so when I'm writing that first draft, I go into my uh, kind of my writing nook every night and it's I'm like, what happens now? I don't know. And so things just kind of or organically evolve. You know, then you get 80, 90 percent into the book and you kind of figure out what the ending's going to be. And then you start thinking, OK, in order for this to happen, I need to go back and layer in a lot of other things. Um, so I just kind of take notes along the way, you know, some ideas. Uh, but then when I start editing, I'm like, okay, let's layer in some foreshadowing. Let's introduce this character differently, whatever, uh, to make sure it all becomes uh, cohesive at the end. Yeah, yeah. When I, whenever I, I write, I always find it a lot more um, fun <laughs> personally to not plot out and to kind of discover it as the characters do. Yeah. And I've, you know, 
and I've not got nothing against plotting. I, I, you know, I interview a lot of writers too, and it's about 50, 50 who, you know, and I think it's just innate to however you do it. Cause I've tried to outline, um, but I almost immediately go off roading, you know, because I think, you know, I think of something more interesting that I wouldn't have thought of if I was just sitting down trying to plot. Uh, but that's how, how my brain works. Mm-hmm. When you're writing, do you sometimes feel like the, and I've heard a lot of authors say this before, but do you sometimes feel like the, characters are kind of like moving through you and you're like just kind of following where they want to go or yeah sometimes i mean i i've heard that description before too and, and sometimes i think that could be a little bit precious um you know to talk about how your characters are dancing and you're just you know following their lead uh but i think there are certain scenes where not that the characters are telling me what to do but i can just so visualize i'm a very visual learner and 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 in my life and all of a sudden if i know i just i can see this entire scene as if i'm watching a movie then it becomes very easy to write and that doesn't happen very often but when it does it's it's pretty satisfying yeah are there any other like quote-unquote magical moments like that um in your writing that you've encountered (sighs) yeah i mean you'll be what's so amazing when you don't plot and I've talked to other pantsers who do this as well, is when you have that kind of that aha moment of like, oh my God, this is what this book is about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, and you know, you, so you're kind of just hoping your subconscious is working the whole time and is leading you in the right direction uh, into a story that's going <laughs> to make sense and be interesting and have some kind of, you know, thematic elements to it. And if you're not thinking about that on a conscious level, and then all of a sudden it just reveals itself, that's amazing. And that, you know, that happens probably two or three times in the course of a book. And you're just like, wow, okay, I, I got to go change a bunch of stuff now, but this is what this book is about. Um, so that's always exciting. Yeah, that, that is a great moment. It's it's kind of like, um, at least I, I've had this happen before where I write something and I kind of don't know what it means. <laughs> um, and then right. like, I go back and like, I keep writing and then like a month later, I look back and go, oh my God, it all lined up and had this like metaphor that I was not even trying to do. (laughs) Right. And what you have to be careful about, what I have to be careful about is sometimes I'll think of something that is kind of that I don't quite know what this means, but I love how it's worded and I, it's, it's great. Um, it, sometimes you got to be careful not to shoehorn your entire book into that, you know, metaphor just because you like that one section. And I've done that before too, where I'm like, oh, it's about this. And I'm like, nah, this is, this is not working out. Um, and that's when you got to kill, go back and kill the darling. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> in your writing, have you ever had a time where it's, where you've had to like completely delete an entire book or an entire like draft? No. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, well, I, so just to back up a little, my first three books never sold that, that I wrote. Um, and, and one of them, uh, I, you know, I, my agents like, this is, what is this? This is way too dark. And I actually then inserted, you know, a new protagonist and rewrote the entire book and it still didn't sell. Um, so that was a bummer, but yeah, more, you know, more often than not, it's more about cutting major passages. So you get this editorial letter that says, here's what I like about the book. Here's what needs work. And so I'm working on some edits right now that were pretty brutal, you know, that were like, I'm, you know, okay, these, these 8,000 words need to be cut and then replaced with something else that makes, <laughs> makes more sense. So it's a long months long process sometimes. Um, but you know, hopefully it all works out in the end. That's really interesting. So when you're writing now that you've written many books, um, have you noticed like how you've changed as a writer from the first pub- thing that was published to now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, first of all, the physical act of writing has become much easier. I mean, when you're first starting and, and, you know, by way of background, I had zero experience writing. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So when you're actually crafting sentences, it's painful because you don't know really quite how to do it, you know, on a creative front, you know, 20 years later, that part's easy. Like if I know what I'm going to write about the actual act of writing it, it just flies by because I built that muscle. It's like working out. Um, and of course, like, you know, you're what you write about totally changes because, you know, when I first started writing, you know, my, my, 
daughter wasn't even born yet. Now she's a freshman in uh, college. So like as you're going through young adulthood, that influences things that you think about. You might write more about family stuff. Um, but I think some of my earlier books were were probably even darker <laughs> than what I write now. Um, so, you know, everything changes over time. And I'm glad, you know, because that makes it fun. Yeah, for sure. Um, like, and also throughout your books, do you feel like your process has had any big dramatic shifts at any point? No, I mean, you know, there's... I. I still have another full-time job, so I've always had to figure out how do I do this? How do I juggle both? Um, I think I've become more efficient in my writing um, and I've been able to say, okay, I've got an hour now. Let's be productive about it rather than just sitting there waiting for the muse to come. So I think I've become much more disciplined. Um, I think I've become much more practical about the about the the art of writing. You know, it's not just about letting your creative forces flow, but about making deadlines and working with publishers and learning the industry and understanding PR and marketing and all that kind of stuff. So um, I, I've become more savvy, I think, about the world of, of writing and publishing than, than I certainly was uh, years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so kind of shifting what you're saying, but what is some of the best writing advice that you could give to young writers? I mean, I think I'm just going to echo what I said earlier. Just get get it done. Um, I do know a lot of aspiring writers who are just like, you know, it's taken me years to write this book because, you know, I keep changing my mind and like just just write it and be just and no, it's never ne it's never, ever, ever going to be perfect. It's never going to be close to perfect, but it'll be done and you can work on it and then you have to release it. You know, at some point you have to release it, whether it means it gets published or you're moving on to another project. Um, I think if you let it consume your every thought, you know, it's <laughs> you're in for a long road. Um, so I, I think writers really have to approach writing as a job. You know, and there's some days that it sucks and it's like data entry and you're just sitting there and it's painful, but you're still doing it rather than just waiting for you to be in the mood. You know, um, so I think that's a real impediment to a lot of writers is that kind of, you know, self-doubt and, and those kind of limitations. Oh, you are so right. I've I've had that happen with me, especially lately um, with my writing where it's been like I before for the longest time, I wouldn't write at all because I was like, well, I don't have the creative thing right. striking. Um, but and, and even if you know what you're doing for me, I still hate my book at the end of it because I've been so close to it for so long. And you do lose a lot of perspective of like, I have no idea if this is good. I have no idea if that makes any sense. But if you kind of just keep in mind, like, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, get it done and then step back and look at it with fresh eyes, um, because there's nothing more daunting than an unfinished manuscript. Yeah, you are so absolutely right. Um, so while writing this book, who is your favorite and least favorite character to write or who is oh. most difficult to write? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think I introduced... Um, Marlo's father, who's from Ireland. Um, and I, I definitely had an idea how I wanted him to be, but it was difficult making sure I was faithful to, um, you know, sayings <laughs> and, and word choice for dialogue from an Irishman, um, working class Irishman. So that was a little bit difficult. Um, I, I think one of my favorite characters to write was, uh, the the seven year old boy uh, Bo, uh, because I just I could just see him and I could just hear his voice so clearly and just knew kind of his perspective on things through the confusion and the grief and the pain and and the moving. Uh, I'm just like I was really keyed in on that kid <laughs> for for better or for worse. I just really kind of got him, so he was fun to write for sure. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Bo is definitely I think so far either my favorite character or one of my favorite oh, characters good. yeah because he he really does come alive off the page when you you were reading him yeah he's pretty precocious and pretty cynical for a seven-year-old um and but he's also a seven-year-old so there's still that extreme vulnerability um uh, to him as well yeah it, it makes for a really dynamic character for sure oh, good so actually i would like to talk about that a little bit more um Bo and Maggie, how did you get into the heads for these writing these kids and 
figuring out what their perspective would be on all this because it's it's a very sensitive subject talking about the the grief in children like this. Yeah, and it's again, you know, you you hope kind of just your inherent empathy as a writer works, you know, because you know I certainly wasn't basing their experiences on anything that I went through as a kid, um, but I've gone through that age as a parent. And, you know, I know how kids act and I know how even, you know, the closest of siblings, in this case, twins can be vastly different uh, kids. And, and I wanted them to be very different. I didn't want them to be the stereotypical, you know, twins where they were, could complete each other's sentences. Um, so, yeah, it was just a matter of, of, you know, tapping into my memories of being a father of, of kids that age and thinking, well, how would they how would they have reacted in these scenes and then then taking some liberties from there? Yeah, it provides a really nice perspective, too, on some of the things happening with Marlo to see it kind of reflected back in how the kids are behaving. Um, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's that constant pressure on Marlo to be like, as much as I want to, you know, fall into this mental abyss and feel sorry for myself. And even though I have all this money, I just want to curl up into a ball and grieve for the rest of my life. He has to <laughs> take care of these kids. And sometimes he has to be reminded of that, not only by his kids, but by his father. And just knowing that what a struggle, you know, to, to have that kind of responsibility, um, to take care of kids who are going through their own stuff and not really getting a lot of help doing it. Yeah, it provided a really nice anchor to the book too, because you got to you got to see this family, and it also, in some parts at least, it put a little bit of a little bit of lightness in it in a in a very heavy book to see like the, the, they're still kids, they're still playing Xbox, they're still right. doing things. Right, right, yeah. You move into this huge mansion, and you're seven, even though you've lost a parent. There's still that like. What, this is what is this place? This is you know this is a whole new castle for us to explore, um, mm -hmm. and then they they explore a lot and they find things in the house and you know it becomes creepy as well. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know I had such a great time talking with you today. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Molly. It was my pleasure. Yeah, um, I just have one last question, uh, yes. and that is, what do you have coming up? So I'm working, as I mentioned, on these <laughs> these tremendous edits on this mm -hmm. book, um, and it's um, you know it's a it's a period piece. It's 1987, and it's a 21 year old uh, woman who's a savant, uh, and uh, it's it's been it's been a real labor of love to write it and <laughs> to continue to to edit it. And um, you know, if all goes well, it'll come out probably late 2023. No time. That sounds yet. so exciting. Well, <laughs> I I know that I will definitely be wanting to read that as soon as it comes out. Oh, um, great. I appreciate that. Yeah. Anyone listening to this, go read all of Carter Wilson's books because they're all so good. Um, for Read Between the Lines, my name is Molly Southgate. I'm Carter Wilson. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after. The, the end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. You can follow the show on Instagram and Facebook at Read Between the Lines Podcast and on Twitter at RBTL Podcast. Make sure to follow the authors who I've been talking to to hear all about their upcoming projects and also because they're cool people. This show is hosted by me, Molly Southgate, and produced and edited by my dad, Rob Southgate. Read Between the Lines is a Southgate Media Group production, and you can find all the great content put on by the network at southgatemediagroup.com. You can read the story of how I and many other podcasters started in the anthology book Pod Life, which you'll find at the link in the show notes. Also in the show notes are links to buy the books featured on this episode. Using those links supports this show and the incredible authors being interviewed. Have a great week and keep reading.